Welcome to this video, where we're going to be discussing the mechanism of action of salbutamol, also known as albuterol. Salbutamol is a short-acting beta-2 agonist, and an agonist is something which initiates a physiological response when bound to a receptor. Salbutamol selectively binds to beta-2 receptors. A beta-2 receptor is a subgroup of adrenergic receptor. Adrenergic meaning receptors which bind adrenaline and noradrenaline. Therefore, when salbutamol binds to a beta-2 receptor, it mimics the effects that adrenaline and noradrenaline would normally have. Because salbutamol mimics the effect of the sympathetic nervous system, it is known as a sympathomimetic drug. So let's look at the mechanism of action of salbutamol. Salbutamol works by binding to beta-2 receptors which cause a response from the cell on which the receptor is located. So the effect that salbutamol has will vary depending on where the beta-2 receptor is located within the body. Beta-2 agonists are predominantly used in respiratory medicine to ease bronchospasm, but other cells within the body also contain beta-2 receptors. Organs where beta-2 receptors are present include the bronchial smooth muscle, which is the target site of salbutamol. When salbutamol binds to beta-2 receptors in bronchial smooth muscle, it causes an intracellular cascade that inhibits contraction of the muscle fibres. This leads to relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle and stops any bronchospasm that the patient may be experiencing, such as in asthma attacks or anaphylaxis. This relaxation of bronchial smooth muscle leads to an increased airway diameter and an easier passage of air making it easier to breathe. Another clinically important site where beta-2 receptors are found are on the surface of mast cells. During an asthma attack or during anaphylaxis, these mast cells undergo degranulation, which is the release of histamine and leukotrienes that are responsible for bronchospasm, vasodilation, and increased capillary permeability. Stimulation of beta-2 receptors on the surface of mast cells will inhibit the release of these inflammatory mediators, which is extremely beneficial in asthma attacks and anaphylaxis. Other sites of beta-2 receptors include skeletal muscle spindles, which, when stimulated, increase the rate of contraction. Which is why patients may experience tremors after beta-2 agonist use. There are beta-2 receptors within the myometrium of the uterus, which can cause uterine relaxation. There are beta-2 receptors within the ureters and when stimulated cause relaxation of the smooth muscle, thus reducing urine entering the bladder. There are also receptors within the bladder itself which causes bladder relaxation to prevent the excretion of urine. And finally, the GI tract, reducing GI motility and the secretion of gastric enzymes. 
Although there are beta-2 receptors present in these different tissues, often several adrenergic receptors coexist. And there is usually one type of adrenergic receptor that dominates and is responsible for the tissue's adrenergic response. Now let's look at the intracellular cascade that takes place when salbutamol binds to its receptor. In understanding the clinical application of salbutamol, this part really isn't important, so feel free to skip ahead. Timestamps are in the description below. Because salbutamol is primarily used for its bronchodilatory effect, we're going to look at a smooth muscle cell within the bronchi and the intracellular cascade that takes place once salbutamol has bound to a beta-2 receptor. Beta-2 receptors are seven transmembrane receptors which means it passes through the cell membrane and does so seven times. Each of these seven subunits that pass through the cell wall are called alpha helices, and an alpha helice is how we describe the coiled shape of an amino acid. These seven transmembrane receptors are also known as G-protein coupled receptors. As the name implies, these are coupled with G proteins that are located within the cytoplasm. These G proteins have the ability to bind guanosine triphosphate, known as GTP, and guanosine diphosphate, known as GDP, which is why they are given the name G proteins. In the inactive form, these G proteins are bound to guanosine diphosphate. G proteins consist of three subunits labelled alpha, beta and gamma, which are just the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, and GDP is bound to the alpha subunit. So now we have an understanding of the G protein coupled receptor's structure, let's look at the intracellular cascade that takes place. Once salbutamol has bound to the receptor on the outer surface of the cell, the G protein coupled receptor will undergo conformational change. This conformational change will cause the alpha subunit to detach from the guanosine diphosphate and will instead bind guanosine triphosphate. This will cause the alpha subunit to disassociate from the beta and gamma subunits and will then bind to and activate a membrane-bound protein called adenylyl cyclase. Some textbooks will refer to this as adenylate cyclase, but essentially it means the same thing. Once activated, adenylyl cyclase will use adenosine triphosphate, otherwise known as ATP, which is the primary source of energy for cells. It will remove two phosphate groups, and convert it into cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Cyclic means a circle, and in chemistry, this would be one form of circular bonding. Cyclic adenosine monophosphate is just adenosine monophosphate that has been transformed into a circular structure with bonds by adenylate cyclase. This cyclic AMP will now bring about a response from the cell, which makes cyclic AMP a second messenger. Cyclic AMP will then act upon protein kinase A, and the activity of protein kinase A is directly dependent on the levels of cyclic AMP within the cell. Remember that a kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphate group to another molecule known as phosphorylation. In this intracellular process, protein kinase A is going to phosphorylate, so add a phosphate group, onto the myosin light -like chain kinase. The myosin light -like chain kinase is responsible for adding a phosphate group to the light -like chain of myosin in the presence of calcium and calmodulin thereby activating myosin so that it can interact with the actin, causing muscular contraction. 
So when protein kinase A adds a phosphate onto the myosin light chain kinase, it inhibits it from working. Therefore, there is a reduced activation of the myosin, which means there is a reduction in the actin myosin cross bridge formation, leading to reduced contraction and relaxation or in this specific case, relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle. Now that we have an understanding of how salbutamol works, let's look at its clinical application. Salbutamol is most commonly used in respiratory medicine to relieve the symptoms of an asthma attack or other conditions associated with reversible airway obstruction such as exacerbations of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and anaphylaxis. Due to the short-acting nature of salbutamol, it is used as a reliever therapy, meaning patients use salbutamol when they are experiencing symptoms. Longer-acting beta-2 agonists can be used in the prevention of symptoms in asthma and COPD. Another use for salbutamol is in the treatment of hyperkalemia. Salbutamol stimulates sodium potassium pumps within cells, which, when activated, remove intracellular sodium and bring in extracellular potassium. This stimulation is achieved through several steps including raised cyclic adenosine monophosphate levels. Sodium-potassium pump stimulation causes an immediate cellular influx of potassium, which reduces serum potassium levels. However, this is also an important side effect of salbutamol use. Patients suffering from an acute severe attack may take repeated salbutamol doses leading to a pronounced drop in plasma potassium. This will be more pronounced in patients with pre-existing hypokalemia, such as malnourished patients or patients treated with loop diuretics. The adverse effects of salbutamol result from its stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. Common side effects include tachycardia, palpitations, anxiety, tremors, hypertension, headaches, and muscle cramps. Very rarely, salbutamol can also cause hyperglycemia and as we've just mentioned, excessive use can lead to hypokalemia. To recap, salbutamol is a short-acting beta-2 agonist, which binds to beta-2 adrenergic receptors and causes a sympathetic response. The main target for salbutamol is the bronchial smooth muscle, but beta-2 adrenergic receptors are also located on other cells and tissues throughout the body which is what causes some of the adverse effects. When salbutamol binds to beta-2 receptors in bronchial smooth muscle, it causes an intracellular cascade that inhibits contraction of the muscle fibres. This leads to relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle, making it easier to breathe. Salbutamol is commonly utilised in asthma attacks as well as anaphylaxis, exacerbations of COPD, and the treatment of hyperkalemia. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other videos on pharmacology, and if there are any topics you would like us to cover, then please leave a comment in the comment section below.